So my name is Professor Chris Lawrence and I am the Associate Dean Indigenous in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. I'm a proud Noongar man from the southwest of Western Australia but I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land which was never ceded on which Monash sits, the Bunurong and Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their ancestors, elders, leaders and emerging leaders. And I welcome you all here um, but before we go into that I'm going to stick to the plan script. I'm going to invite Prof uh, Professor Sue Elliott, who's our Provost and Senior Vice President. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for that warm welcome. I'd like to also acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose unceded land we're meeting today, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I want to give a very warm Monash welcome to Lieutenant General James. It's wonderful to have you here. We really do honour us with your presence. Your visit today highlights the strength and partnership between NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and Monash University's National Indigenous Space Academy program, which celebrates important achievements in this year. The National Indigenous Space Academy program is funded by the Australian Space Ac Academy and continues to be a compelling opportunity for students from Monash and from universities across Australia to obtain lucrative experience at one of the world's leading space research centres. Some of the program's Indigenous interns are here today and it's been a delight to meet you and will be presenting their work including our very own computer science student, Lyndon Beaumont, from the Faculty of Information Technology. Last year, Lyndon travelled to NASA JPL in California and worked on the software maintenance for the spacecraft atmosphere monitor for the International Space Station. But he'll tell you about that himself. Monash strives to deliver education and research of the highest international quality to, uh, to address the key challenges of our time, equipping our students with the ability to drive positive impact within our communities. Immersive and enriching educational experience, such as this internship program, can really make a difference in inspiring students to seek innovative solutions to the world's global challenges. I look forward to seeing our partnership with the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab continue to thrive from the knowledge that will be shared today. I wish to extend my thanks to the collaborative efforts of everyone involved in this fantastic partnership, and I know there's been a number of people involved, but I particularly want to thank Professor Chris Lawrence, whose leadership has been imperative to the success of the Monash University's National Indigenous Space Academy. Thank you all very much and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you for that, Sue. I really appreciate that. And I echo Sue um, in thanking everyone that has been involved um, in organising this event. Um, it's um, you know not an easy thing to do with so many different um, personalities involved. <laughs> I'm just talking about mine as a Gemini, so anyway. <laughs> um, before I, I go, to, I'll go, I'll go to my talk, I just wanted to just say that, um, and I think some of, some of you may have heard me talk about um, this, but I, you know, it's, it's an important thing to acknowledge that Indigenous Australians are the first scientists, technologists, engineers and mathematicians. And if anyone can pick up a piece of wood throw it and make it come back, have got to be innovators, right? Um, and that's in my DNA. And I googled NASA JPL this morning to reaffirm what I already know, and that is that they leverage data and research-backed solutions to increase the equity of their systems and processes. They ensure that every employee at JPL has what they need to reach their full potential, and they continuously elevate and examine their policies and practices to ensure that unconscious bias is not in inadvertently embedded. 
I know, I hope that wasn't in your speech, Larry, but I stole that this morning. I know this is what Monash University stands for too, and that is why I chose to come here. I have a future vision, and that vision is about Indigenous futures in STEM, and some becoming space explorers and researchers. I was born a non-citizen in this country, and I went home to an Aboriginal reservation. It was a time of segregation in this country, and both my Aboriginal parents were taken from their parents and placed into religious institutions and experienced all forms of abuse. When I was at school, I was told I was, these are derogatory terms, I won't repeat them, but I, um, and that I would never achieve anything, and that was often from the teachers. When I look at the high rates of Aboriginal youth suicide, some as young as 10 years old, the over-representation of Aboriginal people in prison, Aboriginal children in out-of-home care, unemployed, alcohol and drug use, homeless, illiterate <clears throat> and lost. I think about the space, I think about space in the universe and I think about what other worlds and life forms might there be. These are the things that drive me as an Aboriginal academic, researcher and leader. These are the things that encourage me, along with my mate, Dr. Adrian Ponce and all the amazing edu education team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to set up the National Indigenous Space Academy in, 20, in actually in 2019. But 2020, COVID-19 put everything on hold like the rest of the world and we went into lockdown. In 2023, we reactivated um, the program and we had over 30 applications, but only five could do an internship at JPL. Three of them here today, and you'll hear their amazing experiences um, in person. I also want to just acknowledge that we did um, uh, partner with the Australian Space Agency who funded um, these, this program in, 23, in 2022, or 2023. <laughs> anyway, yeah, sorry, we are 2024 now. Um, so now I want to just show, go to the um, video. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, do I just press it? Oh, sorry. The National Indigenous Space Academy is an education pathway for Indigenous students who are studying STEM. Uh, so science, technology, engineering, math, to an internship program at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is really about giving those um, Indigenous students who are studying STEM the opportunity to go and be with like-minded people, to experiment, to be part of real-life space programs, and to really think about where they want to be and what they want to do, the career opportunities that are there for Indigenous Australians is, is um, just wide. There's so many opportunities because the Australian space industry is really growing. There will also be um, opportunities for Indigenous businesses to set up their own entrepreneurships and start-up programs uh, because the um, industry will need access to land. We don't even know what the careers are going to be in five years or ten years. So therefore we need to create opportunities for young women to explore, to explore and to increase their interest, increase their analytical skills, increase what their creative thinking, um, their hands-on things, know that any challenges are actually possible through their problem-solving skills and their ingenuity. Doing the NISA program prepared me to do a lot of science and collaborate with a lot of people. I work at the Monash Proteomics and Metabolomics platform where we pretty much do every type of biology. If it wasn't for this program I wouldn't have the experience and skill sets that I require to go out there and really do the science well and help other researchers realise their goals and this is what's enabled me to continue doing research alongside NASA. The students will benefit by going across to America, getting experience and working with NASA. Just simply interacting with people that have the skills and the knowledge that simply aren't here in Australia that we need to get and bring back. Not only are they going to go across and do 10 weeks at JPL on incredible missions, incredible projects, but they're going to do a boot camp beforehand and that's really going to give them the skills that they need to achieve. Even doing an internship at NASA is one of the most high demand, highly sought after spots in the world in any program. Just simply going across makes you one of the best people in the world at what you do. My aspiration is to um, get an Indigenous Australian um, astronaut and I'm hoping that, that uh, she will be a woman and that she will become the first Indigenous Australian to go into space.
leave it there. I think that's enough for one video. Um, we had another video if you want to see more, no. Um, I'm going to um, now invite my... Um, well, these are the students, actually. I should introduce them. These were the 2023 um, students. Um, and so you'll hear from Lyndon, who's here, and Ted, who's here, and Tully. Um, the others couldn't make it, and Renee is not going to this year. We've, um, so she will be going, hopefully, this year um, uh, to do her um, internship at JPL. Um, but I just want to now introduce um, Larry. I think we'll go to the next. Um, this is some of the photos in the background. But I just want to go to um, introduce my friend and my colleague. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I'm <laughs> um, Lieutenant um, General Larry James who is the Deputy Director of uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And together, you know, we've been doing mighty things um, exploring space with JPL. So please welcome Larry. Can I forward myself? Go for it. Oh, go for it, she says, dangerous. I hate standing behind a podium. So, uh, again, Chris and all the leadership here at Monash, thank you. Um, I mean, this is an incredible <laughs> turnout, frankly, an incredible experience. And just to see the passion, uh, just the dedication to our young students uh, and people who are moving into the arena of STEM and other areas, uh, it, frankly, it's heartwarming uh, to see all that's going on here. And, and Chris, thank you for just the... Uh, the initiative to do something like this uh, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of coalescing around many variables, if you will, to make it all happen and yet you've done that. So, and I know many other people are involved. So, so thank you. And again, you just saw those pictures, but uh, you know, what an incredible picture. Uh, and I think the smiles on their face kind of say it all, right? Uh, to have the opportunity to do that. And this is something from a JPL perspective that we are indeed passionate about. Uh, we have uh, a cohort of international interns every summer, but I would say that having this cohort come and be with us for uh, 10 weeks or so is just uh, something that we care deeply about, and we want to make sure that we continue with that. So uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what goes on at JPL. Uh, certainly, probably some of the interns could give some of this talk because they saw it in reality, but um, it's an incredible place, and I think just like a university in some ways, it has a campus-like feel. Uh, we are a part of Caltech. I'm a Caltech employee. And, and so all those things kind of come together to just create this environment that, that leads to initiative and things that have never been done. So with that, we'll just jump right in and talk a little bit about this. But uh, I like to go back to our history. Um, you know, there wasn't always a NASA. Uh, and in fact, uh, we trace our history back to 1936 when a bunch of Caltech students and professors were trying to figure out how to build rockets and they were experimenting with rocket fuel on the campus in Pasadena, and they kept blowing things up. Uh, windows are shattered, doors are broken, people are not damaged, fortunately. So the campus said, please move. And so they literally moved up into the Arroyo, about five miles away, which is where we are today, and set up this little test stand uh, to build this little rocket test. And we call these founding members the Suicide Squad. So. Uh, so that's where we trace our history back to. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to the 50s, uh, Sputnik was launched. JPL at the time was kind of the nation's expert in knowing how to build rockets and potentially put something that could do something in space on top of the rocket. So this is a uh, very iconic picture with on the left of the first, or the director of the lab at the time, Dr. William Pickering, who by the way is from New Zealand. So uh, <clears throat> the New Zealanders are very proud of that if you go to New Zealand. Uh, and then in the middle, Dr. James Van Allen. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, so those little antennae on the, uh, on the spacecraft, actually, it was an experiment he proposed, and he discovered the Van Allen belt. So that was all part of America's first spacecraft. And then on the right, you probably recognize him, Dr. Werner von Braun, who helped us ultimately get the rocket into space. So um, just a proud heritage that we have. We talked about heritage here today, but uh, that heritage of, if you look at the, the newspaper at the time, it said, you know, Caltech launches America's first satellite, or JPL launches America's first satellite, because 
NASA did not exist. Uh, there was no NASA. And so NASA was created about eight months later with the National Space Act in the United States. And they literally came to Caltech and said, hey, would you be our research lab uh, as a part of NASA and come under NASA as what we call a federally funded research and development center. So that's, that's kind of our history. So, uh, so, but we're still Caltech employees. We are under contract to NASA to do these missions. And uh, that's what we've been doing for really, you know, whatever it is, 70 years or so, uh, getting close. And, uh, and the focus that we took at the time was robotic exploration. We said, that's our forte, that's what we want to do in the future. You know, you had uh, folks worrying about manned space flight at the time. You said, that, that's not our forte, let's focus on robotic exploration. So that's who we are. And it all goes back to our DNA from the 30s. So again, a little bit about us. Uh, as I said, we are a federally funded research and development center. Uh, we are university operated. Uh, NASA owns the land we sit on, but we operate everything. You can see our budget there, the number of employees, uh, number of acres, and uh, I especially like this slide. We're bigger than Disneyland and a lot more fun. <laughs> so, at least if you're an engineer. So, uh, and I will say that, you know, it is just fun to go work there, just because the incredible problems that we're trying to solve that have never been solved, and how do you do it, and just see these incredible people try to figure it out. So, it is a lot of fun. Challenging too. And uh, we also have really what are the things that drive us? What are our foci for this organization? And one is just be at the forefront of scientific discovery. You know, I just tell people, you know, our job is to answer those science questions that haven't been answered. Uh, and so that's really what we focus on. And we have this great amalgamation of scientists and engineers and researchers and technologists that all come together to say, okay, how do we answer this? How do we understand what's going on with greenhouse gases on the planet? How do we understand where they're being created and absorbed? We don't know. Let's figure it out. Let's build a system to do that. So, and again, benefit to humanity. I think we all understand that, I mean, NASA is very open. We share all of our data. It's all about, you know, worldwide helping us do better as humanity. Uh, I was just in Europe for vacation last fall, and it seemed like every fifth kid had a NASA t-shirt on. That says a lot, right, in terms of just the power of exploration and the power of space. So, uh, again, that's that part of inspiration. That's really part of our mission. You know, how do we inspire people to go into this field? And certainly helping the broader ecosystem, STEM ecosystem. That's kind of why we're here today, right, to really continue to encourage that STEM development. And finally, as, as Chris said, create the right working environment for everyone. That's just high priority for us. So that's kind of who we are. Okay, let's see here. There we go. This is our family portrait. Um, there will be a test. <laughs> uh, students, you're good with that, right? <laughs> uh, but this, this is all the systems that JPL has built uh, and those that are still operating. If you look at the little thing down at the bottom, the lighter whites are those that we're still building or in development. So uh, just an incredible heritage of systems that really look at our Earth, that look at Mars and the other planets that look at out beyond the solar system. Uh, and so I'll touch on each of these, not each of these missions, but uh, <laughs> it just gives you a sense of what we have put together to really dive in deeply to understand uh, what's going on with our planet. How was the solar system formed? Uh, what's dark matter and dark energy? You know, how do we measure that, et cetera? So, uh, you know, just a lot of stuff. And here we go. This is really the areas we focus in, Earth science. You know, people talk about JPL and they think, oh, Mars and rovers and things out at Jupiter and Saturn. But in many years, Earth science is the largest component of our budget uh, just because uh, it is such an important thing to continue to understand our planet and understand the processes that are going on. I was talking to some of the folks here earlier with, uh, in planetary science and, you know, just understanding our Earth and shipping that data around and, and helping all of us get better at managing where we live, right? It's, it's the only place we know that has life, and let's keep it that way. Um, astrophysics, again, looking out beyond our solar system and the deeper universe and understanding all those fundamental things that happened back at the creation of the universe. And as I said, dark matter and dark energy, exoplanets, big deal now. And, you know, I'll date myself. When I was in high school, we didn't think, we didn't know if there were planets around other stars. We thought our solar system could be it. Now we see thousands, right? So pretty cool. 
solar system, planetary exploration, uh, I'll touch on some of those missions, but you know, understanding our solar system. How did it form? How did we all get here? And finally, uh, one of the reasons I always come to Australia is we have the Deep Space Network site outside of Canberra. So uh, I'll be over there on, uh, uh, what is today? I'll be there tomorrow morning uh, and uh, see how the team is doing there. But just an incredibly long legacy with Australia from the 60s, right? And how many of you have watched the Dish movie? Uh, if, you, if you don't raise your hand, you're not Australian, I think. So. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just that incredible legacy that's always been here, and certainly for us, it's just been a part of our DNA as well. And so that's kind of big picture what we focus on. And so I'll, I'll jump right into Earth science. You can see the areas we work in, kind of the, the water cycle, uh, the carbon cycle, uh, biodiversity, air quality, and again, I'm just going to highlight some of the things we're doing. Uh, one is we do a lot with the International Space Station. Uh, we have a couple of incredible missions up there. One is called Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3. I talked about trying to understand where does carbon dioxide get produced, where does it get absorbed on our planet. This is a mission that's doing that. It's making those measurements to help us understand that cycle and then do something about it potentially. EcoStress is another mission that um, it's really an IR sensor and its primary mission is to look at plant health. If you think about plants, um, if they are absorbing water and transpiring, they are cooler. The evaporation makes them cool. If they're drought stricken or not able to absorb water, uh, they're not aspiring and then uh, they're warmer. And so we can literally measure plant health from space by looking at their IR signature. But another thing we can do there that I like to highlight because I know it's an issue for Australia as well as us is wildfires. We can literally see, you know, wildfires with this IR sensor and if we're at the right place and right time, provide information to the firefighters and those sorts of things and help manage that. And there's a whole NASA program called FireSense that's looking at how do we better help manage fires from space. You know, look at the foliage beforehand, understand what's happening in real time and, and provide that information. So uh, just uh, some good missions that we have on the space station. Uh, I highlight this because this is a partnership with uh, Australia. Uh, this is the CSIRO organization looking to build a, a mission called AquaWatch. And you see on the lower left there, that's a hyperspectral imager that NASA JPL will provide for that mission. Uh, and primarily looking at uh, coastal water health. So looking, and, and fresh, fresh river health in terms of algae blooms and those sorts of things. So uh, I was just at CSIRO yesterday talking to the team that's putting this together. You know, they're, they're taking it a step at a time, but uh, uh, this would be, you know, an Australian mission that would really benefit Australia with JPL participation. So we're excited about that and working with CSIRO on that. Um, and then EMIT is another mission that we fly on the space station. It's really a earth mineral mapper. So it's, again, got this hyperspectral capability that's looking across all these mineral deposits on the earth's surface. It was originally designed and built to understand these large dust clouds that come off of Africa each year and then influence the weather in North and South America. But the issue is that the scientists don't know what the mineral content of those dust clouds are and that dramatically affects reflectance and what does it impact and so on. So this mission will measure the mineral content of those dust clouds as they come off of Africa. But we've also found it's really good at measuring mineral content on the surface and more importantly uh, it can detect methane. And so methane, as most of you know, is, is a big greenhouse gas. In fact, uh, the latest UN COPUS, I think year before last, they highlighted the capabilities of this sensor to help us understand what's going on in the methane domain uh, on the planet. And, uh, okay, let's see, a green screen. Let's try again. Uh, uh, I think it's a video that's probably gonna, there we go, we'll see. This. So, uh, you know, I've talked about partnering with Australia. We also partner with many other uh, com uh, countries. Uh, this is a mission called SWAT, Surface Water and Ocean Topography. It was a partnership with CNES, the French Space Agency. Uh, first time we've done a, basically a radar interferometer in space. So I've got two radar beams. They create an interferometric pattern on the surface of the ocean, but also never been done before on the surface of freshwater bodies. So now we can actually not only measure ocean height and currents much more accurately than we've ever done in the past, but for the first time we can measure fresh water body heights and currents to some level. We've never had a global picture of the fresh water bodies around the earth. 
I mean, you've got, you know, various pieces and pockets of data, but, you know, small lakes in the north of Russia or whatever the case may be, we're now getting a global picture with this spacecraft that, again, helps our scientists start to understand what is going on with the water cycle. Where is all this water? How much fresh water is there? And so on. So we launched this about um, uh, 16 months ago, December of 22, and it's just been an incredible mission. Uh, scientists just love this capability, the data they're getting, but uh, very important for, again, understanding the water cycle. And so we'll skip by that one. Uh, this is another partnership we have with India. Uh, it's called NISAR, which is the NASA Indian Space Research Organization, that's the I, uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar. So uh, probably about 10 years ago, uh, we you know, started some dialogue with India about developing this capability. Uh, it was a high priority for us. It was a high priority for the Indians because what it does is it measures changes in the Earth. So it will look at changes in the shoreline, for example, around India, what's going on with erosion and sea, sea level rise. It will look at changes in biomass and those sorts of things. It will look at changes in the ice sheets like Greenland or the Arctic and so on. So uh, first major partnership we've ever had with India uh, and really has uh, set a high bar for doing things well together. So uh, the front end of that on the right is the L-band, S-band synthetic aperture radar payload and the back is the the satellite bus, if you will, that provides the, the telemetry, the communication, the attitude control. So we put the radar together in, in uh, California and the Indians built the bus. We shipped the radar over to India, to Bangalore, and that's where we've been for the last 14 months integrating the spacecraft and the radar and doing all the testing. And now uh, we're on schedule to launch in the May timeframe from India. So again, just a tremendous partnership for the United States and India to be working that together. And there it is, getting ready to go into the uh, thermal vacuum chamber in Bangalore. Uh, that's probably about a month ago now that uh, you can see the, the radar payload and then the satellite bus a little bit on the back of that. So uh, again, uh, and again, it's an important science mission for all of us. Uh, just talking a little bit about smaller things. Uh, these are CubeSats. It's a mission called Prefire, uh, which will have radiometers on board and they will fly over the Arctic to understand what is essentially the reflectance of the ice uh, and again that amount of reflectance dramatically impacts the atmosphere above it and potentially impacts uh, you know the atmosphere around it so just you know this the, the sensor capability that we now have that can be miniaturized and put on small spacecraft is giving us a lot of new capability that's not all that expensive but still does incredible science. So uh, we've been assembling these here at JPL and they'll be launching uh, later this year, ideally. So uh, that's another Earth science mission. And now uh, looking out beyond the Earth into the deep of space to boldly go where no man has gone before. And none of the younger people know what that means. <laughs> Star Trek. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you. I don't feel so old. Uh, but... Um, you know, we all hear about James Webb Space Telescope, I'm sure, and that's an incredible mission. JPL built the IR sensor for that. Uh, but this is the next uh, big telescope that NASA is working on, launching in 2027, called the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. Uh, primary mission is to look for signs of dark energy and dark matter using galactic lensing, and don't ask me to get into the physics of that. But, uh, you know, it's this weird stuff that, you know, we're trying to figure out. But the other piece that we're doing is using this telescope to actually try to image planets around other stars. Today we find exoplanets by just when they transit in front of the star, we can see the star dimming and brightening and that says that's indirect evidence there's a planet there. But to actually image another star is another challenge and what's lock the starlight very, very, very precisely, but still allow you to see the reflected light that's coming off a planet orbiting that star. So that's what this instrument does. It's probably the most, it is the most sensitive coronagraph ever built to be allowing you to do that. That's at the lab at JPL. It's currently in environmental testing, but uh, ideally this will allow us to actually see the light coming from another planet. And then once you have the light, you can do spectroscopy. So now I can start to look at the content of whatever I'm seeing, um, you know, mineral wise, element wise, is there methane there? Is there oxygen there? So it will give us a lot more information about these planets around other stars. Probably the bigger planets right now, probably not Earth size. 
that's the next generation of telescope that NASA is planning called Habitable Worlds Observer. So we'll be involved in that downstream. And we also have an artist community there at JPL, and they come up with these cool 1930s travel posters. So, so any of you want to, so any of you want to go to another planet around an exoplanet, another, around another star? We have Kepler 186f, which uh, surrounds a red star where the grass is always redder on the other side. So uh, pretty clever. You can download these on the internet. You see them all over the place. Uh, another mission looking at our sun. Um, one of the things that we worry about when we look at the sun is you think of solar flares and those can impact the earth. There's this other thing called coronal mass ejections. So that's when big chunks of the sun just come off and can be very devastating to our electrical infrastructure. And so what this mission is, is really six small CubeSats that basically are just radio frequency receivers and they will form a virtual large antenna as they fly in formation which will allow us to see the radio frequency precursor of a coronal mass ejection. So when a coronal mass ejection happens, you didn't know you are getting a physics lecture here today, did you? Uh, but when a coronal mass ejection happens, it also is accompanied by low frequency radio waves. The problem is you can't see those on the Earth. They're attenuated by the atmosphere. So we had to put this big antenna into space, and we see the low frequency radio wave, which arrives much faster than the actual coronal mass ejection. So it's kind of an early warning system, if you will. And also doing good science to really understand this crazy star that we have and all the stuff that's going on. But that will be launching in 2024, ideally, uh, this year. So moving on to planetary. Um, OK. Um, I was actually talking to the CSIRO folks about this just before coming over here. But uh, a couple of rover programs that we are currently working on for NASA uh, to go to the moon. Uh, I think you all know that NASA is sending astronauts to the moon here soon and, and with the Artemis program. I know Australia signed the Artemis Accords and all those things. Uh, the mission you see up top is really continuing to develop autonomy in our robotic systems. So these are a, a set of three small rovers with a base station that will operate autonomously on the moon and coordinate with each other and they have a ground penetrating radar and it's really about how do we work systems together smartly with AI to really go to the right places and operate together without human interference. So we've actually finished building those. They're in storage and they will launch on, I think, the uh, Intuitive Machines Mission 4 or 5, ideally later this year, early next year. And then on the right, or the lower right, you see something, a big rover called Endurance A, which uh, NASA wants us to build, which if you think about our Mars rovers, Curiosity, Perseverance, they maybe will travel on a good day 100 meters, uh, on a really good day maybe 150 meters with autonomous nav going on. They want this rover to do 2,000 kilometers in three years. And we've never done anything like that. But they want to, and also autonomously sample the lunar south pole and then bring the samples back to the astronauts. So again, those are the kind of fun problems that your interns get to work on. So uh, have at it. Uh, so that's, that's in the design phase right now, and uh, we're excited about that. Okay, moving out beyond uh, that area of the world is uh, our next big mission to the outer planets called Europa Clipper. Uh, it is going to fly by the moon Europa multiple times because Europa is a water moon. Again, dating myself, when I grew up in high school, we thought the Earth is the only place that has water in the solar system. We see water nowhere else. Turns out there's a lot of water out there. So Europa is a water moon. It's got an icy shell. And beneath that icy surface is liquid water. And we think probably two to three times the amount of water that the entire Earth has on one moon of Jupiter. So obviously that excites the scientists. They say, well, how does that happen? What, what are these, all, these weird styrations on the surface? What are they made of? So this mission is currently in final test at JPL. Uh, it will launch in October out of uh, Cape Canaveral on a Falcon Heavy and uh, spend the next six years going out to Jupiter. Uh, it's a long way there. But really should give us a lot of, it's got ice penetrating radar on board, it's got spectrometers, it's got high definition cameras, it's got magnetometers, all kinds of instruments. So really give us a much more complete picture of this water moon that's out there at Jupiter. There we go. Uh, this is our mission headed to the asteroid belt. It's called Psyche, and it's named for the fourth largest asteroid. 
So why do we want to go there? What excites the scientist about that? Well, it's, we think it's pretty much an all-metal asteroid or mostly metal asteroid. And based on that, scientists think that it's actually a planetary core that's been exposed over time by asteroidal bombardment. So we can directly examine a core of a planet. So instead of having to drill down 3,000 kilometers of stuff here on the Earth and try to find our core, we can go look at one. So that's the reason we developed this mission to go out and do that and take a look. And so we launched that last October. It's on its way. It'll go do a gravity assist at Mars here in a few months and then slingshot out to the asteroid belt and get there in 2029. So <laughs> these are long missions. And of course, uh, our helicopter, the little helicopter that could on Mars, uh, originally designed as a technology demo, uh, five flights, and we were going to call it success, and it completed 72 flights uh, before, unfortunately, we had to declare the end of the mission because we think it landed on a rock or something, maybe tipped over a little bit while the rotors were still going, and the rotor hit the ground and broke. So, um, so, but just an incredible mission, first aeronautical vehicle on another planet. It's really leading us to think a lot about what's next with, well, we've got octocopter designs now that we can put bigger payloads on and go down canyon walls and do, you know, investigation and those sorts of things. So, uh, and of course, uh, the, our Perseverance rover continues to collect samples for an eventual return to the Earth. That's kind of the next big Mars mission is bringing those samples back. So you can see, you know, we normally cache the samples inside the rover. But for redundancy, we placed 10 samples on the surface of Mars so that if the rover broke, we could still go out and get those samples when we do the sample return mission. So those are all there on Mars now. On the surface, we know exactly where they are, and then we can go find them if we need to. But the rover continues to work well, uh, continues to collect samples for an eventual return. And I think I've got, hopefully this video works. Uh, uh, let's see. This is the Mars sample return mission, which I've got a video that will show that. If it So bottom line is uh, very complicated to bring samples from another planet. We've never done it before, uh, other than if you talk, you know, the astronauts bringing samples back from the moon. So the whole mission is uh, on the right, you see this big lander. Uh, and the reason, part of the reason is so big, it has to carry that rocket on board and land it on the surface of Mars because that's the way we get the samples off the surface of Mars. So the rover comes up, deposits the samples in this little soccer ball style container that's in the nose cone of the rocket inside the lander. Uh, once they're all deposited in there, we pop the rocket out and air launch it uh, up to space. And then the Europeans are providing the sample return satellite up there that we rendezvous with with the samples. They capture them, uh, seal them up. We head back to Earth and then we return the samples to Earth. So, uh, and so that's what we're currently working on right now to do that mission. Okay, we'll skip the green screen. And then I mentioned the Deep Space Network. I mean, we have to highlight that just because of, again, the historic partnership we've had. 
but you know, as I often say, uh, without the data, all these spacecraft are meaningless. And the Deep Space Network is the, the mission that we have that gets all the data back. So uh, this is our picture out at Timandela, um, outside of Canberra. And again, just a workhorse for us. It's our only site in the Southern Hemisphere. So, for example, Voyager 1 is in the Southern Ecliptic Plane. It's the only site that can talk to Voyager 1 right now. Um, Interestingly, if you've been tra watching uh, the, uh, the landing on the moon with the commercial lander, and they kind of tipped over. And so uh, this past weekend, I was on the text a lot trying to get coverage from the DSN to help them out because they wanted more power to try to get into their communication system. And, and, uh, and Parks was also helping here in Australia. So we managed to get some data, some commands in. So, uh, so again, it's a very versatile, supports multiple missions, not just JTPL, it supports Indian missions out at Mars, UAE missions out at Mars, other deep space missions, but uh, just a jewel for us. Okay, there we go. Hmm, that kind of got out of sequence. Uh, that's the Psyche satellite that I talked about when we were building it. I'm not sure why that ended up there. Here we go. So uh, Voyager 1 and 2, um, you know, Launched in 1977, still operating. Uh, we're having some problems with Voyager 1 right now. We can get commands in, but we get nothing back out, so we're not quite sure what's going on. Uh, but what is that, 47 years, I think, of operation. We hope we make it to 50 years, but we're powered by that little thing on the right side there that sticks out. Uh, that's just a core of plutonium that, as it decays, it generates heat, and we have little thermocouples that take that heat and turn it into electricity. But as the plutonium decays, it gets less. So we're getting less and less plutonium, less and less power over time. And so we're uh, trying to manage that to see if we can make it to 50 years, we'll see. Uh, but just, you think about the technology and it was designed in the early 70s and this thing's still working. And it's out, it's humanity's first interstellar spacecraft. I mean, it's out in the interstellar medium outside the solar system. And I tell people, and this is true, you have more computing power in your key fob than is on that spacecraft. And that is literally true. So if you, we've, we've got a model of the, of the memory device in there. It's just a bunch of rape teal, I mean, tape reels and weird electronics going everywhere. And, and it's like, you know, one megabyte or something, you know, it's crazy. Okay, looking quickly to the future. Uh, um, again, just, uh, I was over with CSIRO looking at the 3D printing area and uh, just all the things we can do now with 3D printing and new materials and those sorts of things. Additive manufacturing is giving us uh, incredible new capabilities that were not even possible in the past with traditional manufacturing and metallurgy. Um, it's not going very fast, okay. Uh, quantum, I know uh, there's a lot of work in Australia with quantum, uh, so we're, uh, big into quantum communication, quantum sensors, uh, etc. We have a, um, a, a payload, uh, an experiment on the space station that's producing Bose-Einstein condensates. That will also be on the test. Uh, but we have three Nobel Prize winning principal investigators on that experiment, really understanding this weird form of matter that you can only do in zero G, if you will, because it collapses if you're in one G. So, we built this thing to go on the space station and create, the, create these condensates and can lead to new ways of doing measurements and sensors and those sorts of things. So some fundamental physics stuff that will, uh, again, a lot of good work going on here with CSIRO in Australia in this endeavor as well. And then, uh, you know, to, to Chris's work and all the work in terms of continuing to build our STEM capacity, continuing to reach out to uh, the indigenous population here as well as other uh, uh, foreign nations. Uh, you know, Chris knows all about this. The team here knows all about this. Adrian's your, pro your, your big pa fan there at JPL, but it's important for us. Uh, again, we want to grow that next generation. Uh, we bring in about 950 interns every summer, um, and, and they, they get real work. It's like, okay, get this circuit designed or you're going to make us miss our schedule. So it's not like, uh, it's, not like it's no pressure. There's pressure, uh, but it's, it's good work, and I think it just uh, it helps to build the ecosystem for all of us. And we're very proud to be a partner with Monash on that. And, uh, and I think uh, we've touched on this. With uh, There's other programs. You can click on the link. Chris knows about some of these things and just various opportunities to, to partner with us and with NASA. That's it. That's the lab. We're all in one place there in Pasadena. Thank you.
for some questions. Maybe, t yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I might open it up. But first I want to, maybe I'll ask one of the students to, who's got a question, because they don't often get the chance to meet someone like Larry. So is there a student there who wants, who's got a question? Hands up right away. Right. Do you want to come out, show your face and introduce yourself? Um, where do I? Just do send I, you, yeah. okay. well, come, come at the front. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask another question after this, Chris. Come on. Close enough. That's good. That's and, good. and which, um, which faculty are you in? Uh, I'm in faculty of mechanical and aerospace engineering. Okay, and excellent. I'm Roger. Uh, I'm looking at a lot of the missions that you have set out, and a lot of them involve, or well, the earth science one, yeah. looking down at earth. I'm wondering how does all the radar and IR sensor go through the atmosphere and all the... Uh, whether that comes into that? Uh, for radar, not really. I mean, uh, when you're up in space and you think about the atmosphere, it's actually a pretty thin layer. It's like you oh. know, 60 miles where you, you know, it's reasonably thick and then it thins out. So radar through the atmosphere, not a problem. In fact, we had a mission 30 years ago that took a radar to Venus and mapped the whole Venus uh, topography through all those thick clouds of Venus. So that's no problem with the atmosphere. And then IR, same thing. I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, IR can be affected if you have a huge cloud or something, a big thunderstorm, or you may not get the visibility, but IR generally goes through a lot of that stuff. In fact, that's why a lot of our telescopes operate in the IR, looking out into the universe, because the visible light, there's a lot of dust out in the universe, and the visible light gets absorbed by the dust, but the IR goes right through it. So IR is a very powerful way to look at things. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Sure, sure. Yeah, just that's fine. We can see you. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to walk up. Um, hello. Hi. Um, my name is Maria, and I'm studying science and IT. Uh, my question is: uh, You were talking about the new mission about studying the corona mass ejections, right? And yes. I would like to ask: What is the advantage of the new mission um, instead of using, for example, the Parker Solar? Uh, um, instrument that we have already sent to yeah, the sun. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Parker Solar Probe is kind of going around the sun. It's doing a lot of close passes to the sun. It wasn't really designed to look at the low frequency RF from a coronal mass ejection. It was designed to do a lot of the science uh, of the sun, if you will. Uh, I think it can see CMEs, but not necessarily designed to really understand that from an you know, detecting it with the radio waves. So really a different kind of mission than, than what uh, the the Sunrise mission will be doing, and much bigger and more expensive. <laughs> First of all, sir, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, my name is Sid. I'm a second year materials engineering student. Okay. Um, my question to you is, yes, scientists and engineers really love these fantastic toys. I like to call them toys. But how do you balance the economics and accessibility aspect to the larger community? Thank you. The economics. Um, hmm. I mean, I, tr I generally look at the big picture, frankly, on the economic side. So if you look at the U.S. budget every year, the NASA budget is like that big, you know. So in general, I would say, that's a pretty worthy investment, looking overall compared to what we spend on the DOD and social programs and all that. So it's a very tiny investment. Uh, accessibility, I'm not quite sure but, uh, what you're referring to there, but I would just say that, number one, I mean, as I said in one of my earlier slides, we, we do this for the good of humanity. I mean, we don't hold the data close to our vest. I mean, we publish everything. Scientists around the world can have access and do their, you know, do their assessment of it and help build that knowledge base and those sorts of things. And then just internally at JPL, I mean, it's all about, uh, again, as I said, everyone being able to contribute to their fullest and utilizing their talents and skills and capabilities and giving them the tools to do that, uh, et cetera. So that's, that's a part of our ethos and who we are. So, uh, but yeah, the budget question is like, oh, you're pinning a billion dollars on this spacecraft. But in the broad scheme of the budget, it's just like nothing. It's tiny, you know? So, so yeah, that's, that's my point, I think.
Yes. Fair to say I'm not a student, right? <laughs> uh, uh, this is a what's your personal view kind of question. You showed some, um, um, you know, some measurements from uh, the, the, the North Pole, South Pole, reflectivity, etc. Yeah. So what is your personal view about large-scale interventions, geoengineering as we used to yeah. call it? Yeah. Great for Mars, not for the Earth. No. <laughs> um, that's that's just hard stuff, right? I mean, uh, you go back to what the '70s or '80s, and they're talking about cloud seeding and trying to create, you know, and none of that really worked very well. I think the the complexities of this environment are just such that I'm not sure you can manage it, you know, on a large scale. I just, you know, even you look at the climate models, and I'm sure there's some climate scientists in here, but you know, they're pretty good near term as you get further and further out, and you know you. You know, your variable to choice starts to make divergence this way and that way. So trying to geoengineer this planet, I think, is tough, uh, if not impossible, frankly. I mean, I think there's small-scale things you can do to be smart, right? But, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's, that's a hard thing. <laughs> Just because this is such a complex ecosystem that we still don't have our arms around in terms of all the interactions that happen, you know, so, yeah. Another one. Hi. Um, you talked a lot about the uh, like different missions and all that. Obviously, very space related and um, a lot of satellites and rovers and stuff. I'm just wondering, um, at JPL, do you still put a big focus on propulsion? With your name being <laughs> propulsion. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's generally why we go by JPL today. Yeah. Uh, really, the only propulsion we have uh, development and research in is electric propulsion for our spacecraft. So, you know, Hall effect thrusters, those kind of things that we do there, and and developing new capabilities there. But, yeah, the propulsion name comes from our time during World War II when the Army took us over and we were doing jet assisted takeoff and all these kind of things and building rockets for the war effort. Uh, and, you know. Once you got the name, it's kind of hard to change it, right? So that's why we do kind of brand it as, you know, JPL, not Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, so generally we just say we're JPL, and most people get that brand now. But, yeah, we're not. But, yeah, we, I mean, up until not that long ago, we had big wind tunnels where they tested the jet engines, right? So, but, yeah, we're no longer doing jet propulsion. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll be around. You'll yeah, hang around. And talk Great. And thank you for such an amazing um, presentation. Um, I know that there's lots of questions, and um, so hang around, and you'll see a bit more, and you'll get to meet Larry, and maybe we will get some photos with the other students, and that'll be great. Um, so now I want to um, go to the next um, presentations, and that's the three. Um, National Indigenous Space Academy students that are here today um, to talk about their internships uh, that they did. Um, so I'll invite Lyndon up, who's already up. Um, who's, so Lyndon Beaumont is um, a Bachelor of Computer Science student here in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. And I'll let him talk about his um, um, project that he worked on. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm Lyndon. I'm uh, currently uh, doing a Bachelor of uh, Computer Science at Monash University. I'm in my fourth year, so I've got one more semester left. And uh, in my free time, I like doing gardening. That's a pomegranate tree of mine about 20 kilometres south here. But yeah, most importantly, uh, last year I, I worked at, for 10 weeks at JPL as part of the National Indigenous Space Academy. So I was in Division 38, which is Observational Instruments, and that's uh, that building right there. So it was quite a walk across the whole campus. And there were two major projects that I worked on. Uh, well, they were both observational instruments. The first was SWIM, uh, which is looking at the water on the ISS. Previously, it was being analysed on the ground, but we want to analyse it on the ISS, so it's uh, continuous monitoring. And my main project was looking at SAM, the Spacecraft Atmosphere Monitor. Uh, so the way SAM works is uh, on the ISS, we've always had systems to analyse the air but we always want to have new systems when we develop new uh, technology. So SAM's based around a mass spectrometer, and it uses a little device on the left there called a red pataya, and it uses that as a control system. But the problem is the red pataya, it runs uh, Debian Linux, 
and Debian Linux, it goes out of date every few years. So if we keep it with the old version of Linux, we're eventually going to have some horrible security problems, and we don't want security problems on the ISS. So my job really was to make sure that everything on SAMS is up to date. So there were kind of three steps that I had to do. So my end goal was to make the version of SAM uh, the newer version. So the first thing I had to do was create all the, compile all the compilation software. And this wasn't trivial because I was compiling it for Debian on a Debian system and it wasn't actually meant to work on Debian so I kind of had to force it to run there. And after that, this is where kind of the real part is. So the way you run an operating system is you stick a little file on an SD card, and then when you power the SAM system, it'll read the file off the SD card, and it'll run that. So I was really trying to build a new file. So the next, the middle step was to uh, modify the script, so when it creates this file, it creates a file running the correct version of Debian. And yeah, there were a lot of problems with this. And the final version, sorry, the final step I had to do was once I made this image, I had to test it. Because if we have something and we don't test it, the astronauts are going to go, oops, uh, something doesn't work, this is a bit of a problem. Yeah, we don't want that. So to give an example of one of the problems I faced, it, I was mostly doing uh, low-level C code changes. Because like, what this one was, after, uh, after I updated the version of Debian, suddenly the compiler is not accepting the line of code because it's got more strict than what it accepts. So I had to uh, change the code with something else. So as a result of my project, I was able to successfully update it so it runs the latest version of Debian. Uh, that's a little, the control module on the left there, running the newer version. And I was also able to create a lot of documentation because previously there wasn't much documentation, so it was really hard for me to do because I had to kind of figure out everything from scratch. So next year when, sorry, in two years when it goes out of date again, the next person will have a much easier time. And yeah, it was a really good internship experience. Uh, I met a lot of great people there. Like That's some of the other interns and some other American interns too. I'm really glad I went. And I'd like to thank uh, Dragan Nikolic, my mentor. Uh, he helped me out with my project. Uh, Arpin and Chris Lawrence for helping uh, coordinate the program. I don't know if anybody wants to ask Lyndon any questions or maybe not put him on the spot too much. <laughs> um, but maybe we'll save the questions for last. Thank you, Lyndon. Very appreciative of that. Um, I want to uh, now call up Tully uh, Ma, who's a, um, from the University of uh, Melbourne, uh, who's doing a Master's of Mechanical Engineering. But I'm not going to um, talk about your project because that is way too long. Uh, you could talk about it. <laughs> so come on. Thank you. Keep going. Is this okay? Keep going. There you go. Yay. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. So my name is Tolly Ma. Um, I'll go to my intro slide first, may as well. So I am currently studying, as Chris said, my Master of Mechanical Engineering specialising aerospace at the University of Melbourne. But my background isn't actually in engineering, so I completed a science degree from the Australian National University. I majored in maths and I minored in physics and chemistry. So I got to the end of that degree and decided I wanted to pursue something a little bit more applied and a bit more in the engineering space. So I am a Gundagara woman. I've highlighted that spot here on the, on the map for anyone who's not familiar with that country. It's a, quite a small one. It's between Sydney and Canberra, essentially. And when I was at JPL, I was interning in the Origins and Habitability Lab. So this was in the Planetary Science Division. This is uh, Laurie, Dr. Laurie Barge is the PI of my lab, and I was working with Dr. Bonnie Teese, who is one of her postdocs. So my project was looking at hydrothermal vent systems in the ocean. So these are a type of chemical garden experiments that I was conducting in the lab. Um, and specifically, I was growing sulfide hydrothermal chimneys in a controlled laboratory environment to create uh, replicas of real-life chimneys. So s specifically, my title was looking at mineral, mineral compositions and concentrations that influence the chimney growth and its morphology. So much more on brand with my science background. Ooh. So here's an example of a chimney I grew in the lab. Um, I would love to show everyone all of the photos, but <laughs> unfortunately do not have time. Um, and so for anyone who's not familiar with what a hydrothermal uh, vent actually is, they occur in the ocean 
Um, and essentially what happens is when seawater percolates through uh, cracks in the ocean crust, it dissolves a bunch of minerals, and then as it comes back up through the cracks in the ocean floor, it interacts with the seawater. And so these two solutions have very different um, compositions, different temperatures, and so when they interact, they form a precipitate, and then over many years, it forms essentially an underwater volcano. Um, so these systems are often characterized by a variety of different temperatures, extreme pressures, anoxic conditions, um, and in particular what I was looking at, the chemical compositions. Um, I could definitely get a lot more into it, but due to the short amount of time, I'll just go to some of the highlights of the internship overall. So one of the biggest highlights for me was actually the Nebula community. Um, when we got there, they took us under their wing. I, Chris, Chris originally set it up. Um, and yeah, that, that crew, they were really special. They really made an effort to make sure that we all felt, felt really welcomed. Um, they created a really safe and supportive space for us. Nebula, yeah. Nebula. Oh, let me, let me elaborate. Yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> oh, did I turn it off? Oh, no, okay, that's okay. Um, yeah, so Nebula is like the, oh, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's the Native American group. Um, so it, yeah, consisted of uh, the Indian Americans and Native Hawaiians and just every, like, yeah, the, the indigenous people of the US. Um, and so it was really lovely to have, I guess, that common experience um, as indigenous Australians, obviously not being in Australia, we were away from our home countries and our culture. Um, and so we got to do a lot of really cool cultural sharing activities with them, which was really special. Um, one of the super exciting parts of my project is I'm actually getting a research paper out of it. So I'm currently still working with my mentors to um, become, I'm first author of a research paper. So this is a huge achievement. I've never written a research paper before, so I'm still really grateful to my mentors for holding my hand through it. <laughs> um, another really key highlight for me was actually just the exposure to the space industry in the US. So obviously Australia's space industry is still growing. Um, and it was really awesome just to see, I guess, the way it operates in the US um, and translate that understanding or l learn how, what my position in the space industry could be. Um, and then most importantly, like the, the long lasting connections and friendships that I've made. So obviously not just with the other interns, some from photos of us, um, but as well, as I said, with the Nebula community, the education office um, and a lot of the other interns that we met while we were there, some really truly special connections were formed. So an acknowledgement slide. Up next, there we go. Um, so, my acknowledgements to the laboratory and my mentors who helped me along the way, and then obviously Chris and the National Indigenous Space Academy for setting up this opportunity. Um, Australian Space Agency and my university were really crucial in supporting me while I was there. Um, and the education office was and Nebula were incredible in making sure that we felt welcomed and supported. Um, and then the other interns in my lab as well um, were just awesome atmosphere. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Tully. Um, and it's great that Tully's getting a um, first author paper and there was something that we encouraged in the program. Um, so when we were there, we were saying to the students, like, make sure you talk to your mentors about getting your name on a paper, um, publish, you know, be a co-author. And I know Lyndon um, is working on a paper um, that we've encouraged him to um, write about his experience. So now I'm going to invite um, Ted up, um, Ted van der Veen, who's going to come up and talk about his um, uh, experience. And it was funny because, um, you know, sending five young people, Indigenous students, to, they all shared a house together. Um, they didn't actually know that until they got there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, welcome. Um, you're sharing a house. And... Um, I think, you know, we had to kind of, I was always, I was like the stressful uncle, mother, whatever, and um, worrying about all of them. And so I was, we knew we were kind of looking at the students uh, before we went and we said, oh, well, there's Ted, Ted's the alpha one. <laughs> he, he'll keep everyone in line. The so the, the dad of the group. But no, thank you, Ted. Here you go. Hello, everyone. So, my name's Ted Van Der Feen. Uh, I'm a Palawa man, so I grew up in Tasmania on the northwest coast, a little town called Wynyard. It's got about 3,000 people, more livestock than people. Uh, I was the first in my family to go to university. I've recently, since coming back from JPL, graduated from Western Sydney University with a Bachelor of Engineering, um, specialising in robotics, engineering and mechatronics. 
I have, I'm one of five siblings. I have a brother, um, huge space nerd. I grew up watching the shuttle launches with my dad, so to get to go on this experience was really special. My project while I was on JPL, I was working on the buoyant rover for under ice exploration with the Ocean Worlds Laboratory. So Kevin Hand, Tom Nordheim, um, my mentor was Dr. Andrew Klesch, who's with the Mission Concept Systems Engineering team. Uh, but my task on Brewy was to develop an obstacle avoidance system using an off-the-shelf sonar solution. Um, so Brewy is sort of an early precursor to rovers that we may one day send to the icy worlds in our solar system, such as Enceladus and Europa. Um, so it's designed to go under the ice sheet and then sort of using buoyancy it'll come up and then drive around to sort of investigate that ice water interface, um, which is believed to be uh, one of the key spots to look for life. Um, so on the right here you can see the graphs where I pulled all of the sonar data off the commercial system. Uh, I designed mounts, electronic components and stuff to interface it with the rover. So I sort of touched every single system and it was really a really incredible experience getting to be able to work on that and then handing it back over to the team and sort of being, being able to see, look back and see that progress that I'd made. It was really awesome. Um, so a little bit of photos and outside of JPL experience, so some stuff I got to do. We got down to the um, California Science Center, I believe it is, and we got to see the Endeavour shuttle. So standing underneath that and looking at the heat proof shielding and seeing all the scorch marks from where it re-entered the atmosphere. Awesome experience. Uh, bottom left is my mentor, Dr. Andrew Klesch. Um, we're standing in front of Brewery, which is currently up on blocks. Uh, and then in the middle is um, one of the engineers from JPL. We got to get out of the city, go and see Joshua Tree National Park for a weekend. And just, yeah, a bunch of activities. It wasn't, the experience wasn't just at JPL. It really enabled us to go and see, like we got out to the Getty and we got to really experience LA culture. It was really cool. And I got down to the Blue Robotics for the day, their headquarters, they're a marine robotics company, their headquarters in LA, and they had an open day, so me and Andy went down. Um, some, some learnings and highlights, I couldn't fit them all onto one slide, but I learned a lot about autonomous path planning, obstacle avoidance. Um, the, it inspired me to do my PhD, which is something that I'm going to be pursuing this year. Uh, things never go to plan, improvise and adapt accordingly. So first, the first week I was there, me and my mentor set out a plan and it immediately went out the window. I caught COVID the week before I came into JPL. That really stressed Chris out a lot, I think. Sorry, Chris. Uh, and I want to return to JPL one day in a postdoc capacity. Um, so a few years down the line now. Some highlights of the experience. I, my mentor was friends with Dr. Charles Alachi, who was the director of JPL during a... Um, Spirit and Opportunities Landing and a bunch of other missions. He was there for a very long time, so getting to sit down and have coffee with him and talk about his experience and knowledge, really cool experience. He bought me a Caltech shirt, which I will cherish forever. Uh, we got to tour the Mars 2020 operations area, so one of the engineers there is an Australian man. Um, he studied at MIT and a bunch of other stuff, but he is one of the uplink um, managers for the team there in Mars 2020, so getting to see where the magic happens, so to speak, was very, very cool. Uh, and just meeting so many people pa passionate about space exploration, I felt like everyone there was sort of my people. They're as big a space nerds as I was, which is really cool. Um, and on to what I'm doing now. So since coming back, I've graduated from university and I'm now with the CSIRO. Um, I'm with the Data61 group in the robotic design and interaction team. Some accomplishments of note of theirs recently, uh, they play second in the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, which was a challenge in America to autonomously navigate some underground mines. Um, and they have recently developed, delivered the multi-resolution spectral payload um, to NASA Ames to go onto the Astro V and image and map the inside of the International Space Station. Those aren't my accomplishments, that's the team's accomplishments. I've only been there for a few weeks. Um, but just, I just want to acknowledge Larry and JPL and Chris and Monash faculty of IT. Incredible, like the experience has changed my life already. Um, and I just am so appreciative of everything and everyone at JPL, the environment there is incredible. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. You, did, you forgot to mention the car you all hired and didn't tell me that they <laughs> hired a car and they were driving around LA, which I told them do not do that, um, but they did. <laughs> they waited until I wasn't there. Um, but that, you know, that's just a snapshot of their experiences and two of the, the other students, C. Dillett and um, Lincoln, but couldn't be here, but they had similar experiences and 
you know, it's changed their, their lives and obviously I know that um, I will be watching their careers and I know that they, they're going to do amazing things. Um, so we'll move on to the next um, speakers. Uh, we've got two more speakers, I think, um, before we go off on a um, tour. So I want to invite um, Professor Jesper. Now, I'm gonna, you, you've never ever told me how to pronounce your last name, so I'm going to just... T Jesper, well, I'm going to say um, um, Kleskov. Kleskov. Like the beer or something, I don't know. But um, Jesper is my colleague. He's the Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Information Technology and he's going to give an overview of our research capabilities um, um, in the faculty and then maybe other, and Anne will then talk a bit more. Thank you, Jesper. Thanks. Close enough. <laughs> Kill skull. All right. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, so I'm Jesper, and uh, I'm a computer scientist uh, by training from Denmark, uh, and I am the Associate Dean of Research here at the Faculty of IT. And before I joined Monash uh, a, a year ago, I was at Data61, CSIRO, there's a lot of uh, links, and I was actually uh, the program director of that program for cyber physical systems, but uh, where Ted had joined now. So I, I understand you met with Navinda Kodjis, uh, earlier today, so he he took over that uh, that role. That was a great pleasure to uh, to work with those people up in Brisbane. And I actually, in my first stint at CSIRO 15 years ago, I worked with the team that operates the radio telescope. So I did get to go to parks and actually play with the dish out there, working on uh, collaborative technologies and so on. So that's um, quickly about the um, the background. But now overseeing the research part of the faculty of, uh, of IT. And when Chris asked me to come and do a presentation that uh, said something about the potentials of uh, FIT, uh, faculty of IT's research in the space area, I thought that's going to be a really long presentation. <laughs> because the, the, the great thing about working in IT is that it is everywhere. It's relevant everywhere. Um, and I mean, space being one of them, I don't think we, any of us could imagine a space program where computers were not involved. <laughs> Mechanically operated spacecraft, I think that, that would probably not really, really get there. And um, so even though that the, uh, in Australia, the people might not think of IT as an area of growth in itself, um, all the areas of growth are enabled fundamentally by IT. So I don't, and that is what makes it really exciting to work in the IT because it's an enabling, enabling technology for so many uh, industries and so many uh, areas from the software systems themselves to the processes by which we develop that software and how we interact with, uh, with that software. And that really is um, how we are, we are organizing our faculty uh, as well. A few uh, highlights uh, about that say something about the quality of the IT research we're doing in this faculty. We are in the in the top 60 in the world. We are above world uh, standard in many particular areas and also um, ranked as as most innovative in many areas. Some of these numbers are a little bit dated, but I'm sure we're still there. So I think the, the short message is that what we do is highly relevant across the board, and we do it really, really well. We are organized into uh, three departments that basically cover what I said before. Everything from the software side, the deep end of the software side, into the methods and into the interactions uh, with these kind of systems. Data science and AI, software systems and cybersecurity, and human-centered computing. That's, that's our faculty. And we are the biggest entity in Australia that actually has a focus on, on IT only. We're the only faculty of IT in, uh, in, in, in Australia. Um, and that is partly because we, we cover really broad and it's one of the good things about being a faculty uh, of IT rather than what I led in Denmark which was a smaller department of computer science is that we, we really cover the, the breadth here. 
These are uh, some of the things that we are famous for in the uh, three uh, departments here. As you can see, we are, we are leading in these three areas of these three departments. Um, and somewhere, uh, some of these also by, by miles. Um, the data science and AI part, of course, is really, really boosting with so much uh, renewed focus on the machine learning and AI side of things. In the software system and cybersecurity, it's things like quantum uh, cryptography that's really, really uh, coming off the, off the ground, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, and in the uh, human-centered computing, it is things like immersive uh, visualization and uh, VR and these uh, technologies and how you actually <coughs> interact with these things. But I think what's common for this is that at the moment, uh, we, we are not doing space work in these areas, but all of the technologies that we are working with are highly relevant in that kind of context as, uh, as well. And I think it's one of the things that's important uh, for, for faculty or uh, like ours is to, to remain to a, so, uh, a big degree uh, general in the uh, solutions and the way that we are we're looking towards solutions. We, we work, of course, very applied, but that is very much cases for developing the underlying science. And I think that's how we are able to maintain the, uh, the level of quality in the work that we, are, that we are doing, that we keep it applicable, not just to this particular case that we are, we are working on. I'm just going to give a very brief overview of, of some of the, uh, the labs that, uh, that we have that are working on particular uh, different things here. We are working with uh, the Australian uh, police force on, on, on uh, challenges that they are particularly facing, but that is again a driver of the development of, uh, for example, machine learning algorithms behind that are able to look at uh, large databases of photos to find illicit uh, photos and identify that. Uh, immersive analytics lab is, uh, as I mentioned before, working very much on the human interaction, human computer interaction with uh, immersive uh, emerging display technologies such as not just virtual reality but also holograms. Uh, that's related to my own research. Um, we have a lab that works very much on, focuses on the software engineering processes. How do we develop this kind of software, not just how is it built, constructed in itself, or the processes by which you do this, uh, securing, uh, ensuring software safety, software security, and so on. We heard before how important it is, for example, in space that these systems are highly reliable. Um, the, our Sensi lab is exploring the more creative side of things. This is a collaboration with, uh, with the arts and design faculty at, at Monash. They do a little bit more of the crazy stuff, if you want. Very, very exciting to, to visit their lab. Um, we have what's called an emerging technologies lab that uh, that actually looks um, more at the technologies in society than the technologies in itself, but really it takes a look at the, the technologies that we see on the horizon. Uh, how how could we imagine that they will actually fit into society uh, very broadly? We are looking at. Um, technologies that are assistive technologies. Um, in, in my own research, uh, this falls under the, uh, the heading of augmented humans. So basically, and also important, for example, in, in relation to, to space, how would astronauts be able to uh, do uh, those difficult things with their bodies that they are, that are, they are required to? Um, we have a, uh, an institute for AI and data uh, futures. Uh, that is uh, linking our AI and data research to um, specific applications, and we are also looking very much on the learning side of things. So I think the reason I, I selected these particular uh, themes here is to show the, the width, the breadth of the faculty of IT. Um, and again, just to finish off, it's from the uh, computing side, it's the processes, and it's the interactions with these technologies. And I'll hand over to Anne to continue on the slides there. Yep. I'll also move away. I'm too short to stand behind that. Um, so I'm Anne Nicholson. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of IT. And I just wanted to add a few more general comments um, from a faculty but also a Monash perspective. Oops, that, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Indigenous engagement and leadership in our faculty, but it's part of the broader Monash um, agenda. 
Uh, uh, Monash has an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander 2030 framework that's really looking at uh, across the board uh, in education and in research and in our people internally at looking at how we can um, advance um, Indigenous engagement and, uh, of course, bring on the students and the next generation across all of our disciplines. So in our faculty, we're very fortunate we've attracted um, Chris to Monash. He's only been here a year and he's obviously done a lot in that time. But we've also been developing um, other uh, Indigenous staff members to support that Indigenous engagement and make sure that it's Indigenous-led, which is a really important component. Um, so within that, we have... Um, we have a, a three-year plan and we're just refreshing it now. So in the top right, it's the, it's the last three years and getting Chris in and having that Indigenous leadership and building that um, Indigenous uh, capacity is really important for anything we want to do in this space. Um, we're looking at everything from introducing Indigenous perspectives into our curriculum. And people sometimes say, well, how does that work for computer science? But when we're talking about information and knowledge which is what the information technology and computing is dealing with, then it brings in the human perspective and the cultural perspectives and so on. Um, we, uh, we've got particular programs which you've heard a lot today about um, NISA. Chris has also um, established a, uh, with a number of the other faculties, including um, engineering and uh, business, uh, the Monash Indigenous Innovation Challenge, where we put out a call and got great responses from Indigenous communities to bring our problems to us for a day. We had a pitch day and we're following up with five projects um, being uh, funded and explored. They're really seed funded uh, projects, but where our researchers and academics are working with those Indigenous partners and communities to solve the problems that they brought to us rather than us going and saying, here's our technology, what can you do with it? Um, and, you know, in terms of developing um, and attracting more Indigenous students into our curriculum, we've heard from um, across STEM, you know, some ex examples here today. But we also know that... Um, there aren't as many um, mentors and role models in STEM for Indigenous students. So we, we've got some that we're developing now, but we're also looking at um, putting in place uh, in our industry-based learning program a guarantee for um, any Indigenous students that, that come. Um, I also, I had to make up this slide this morning, so it's got no pictures on it, so don't worry about reading it, but this is for my benefit. I was sort of like, well, what are we doing in the faculty with our research, engaging with Indigenous researchers and collaborators? And it's really an amazing set. So Chris has got a couple of his projects which are around um, Indigenous health and using mobile apps um, and technology to help um, support um, Indigenous communities, access health and so on. So there's a couple there, one around um, ear health and mental health for young people in Western Australia. But um, and Chris is also developing um, a proposal and, and collaboration with people in cybersecurity about some of the particular challenges with cybersecurity that Indigenous communities might have. Um, there's a few other ones there. In particular, um, I want to call out the Indigenous Data Sovereignty and Living Archives. Um, the challenges of the data that's kept about everyone, the privacy, the access, the rights, it's really compounded for our Indigenous communities because of historical reasons for all the sorts of things that have happened historically. Who has that data? Who owns it? And we're really looking at how we can change that um, management of data and really turn it back into being Indigenous-led for Indigenous people. So I just wanted to call that out and say that what we're hearing today is part of a, a broader um, um, effort at Monash. So we're really good at lots of things in technology, engineering and sciences. We've seen that we're innovative in the programs that we'll support um, and we're looking at broadening in education and in research how we can take the things that we do really well in technology and walk together with um, Indigenous communities, Indigenous researchers and so on um, uh, around their problems and what they care about um, while just achieving great things. And I want to thank Chris for his leadership in this area and uh, helping progress this. So thanks. Thank you, Anne. So yeah, we, do, we do have um, a couple presentations. We've got Another presentation here from um, Associate Professor Daniel um, Edgerton Mitchell. Got enough. Got enough. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's harder than it looks, Anne. I insisted on having a lot of videos in mind, so we'll switch over to a separate one. 
and hopefully no green screens. I might not be quite as good at thinking on my feet. All right, uh, so thank you very much for the introduction, Chris. My name is Daniel Edgington Mitchell. Uh, I'm the course director for aerospace engineering uh, as part of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And the title I've gone with is Rocketry at a Range of Scales. Uh, it's a bit of a reach, but it sort of seemed like a catchy title, so I went with it. Oh, we've got our first green screen. I, I feel the pain now. <laughs> Bottom left there, that's meant to be the, the space shuttle main engine igniting, so I'm a little concerned how the rest of this is gonna go. So uh, I wasn't really sure what to talk about today, uh, sort of gone with is rockets, good at reaching space, good at reaching people. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some ways which we've used rockets as an outreach tool here at Monash. Uh, and then in what I fear might sound terribly self-aggrandizing after IT, I'm only going to talk about my own research in the second half of the talk, <laughs> rather than talking about the Faculty of Engineering, but uh, it's about rockets at least. So. We're very fortunate here at Monash that we have these wonderful student teams, uh, which our visitors will be seeing today, and they really do a lot of the heavy lifting uh, when it comes to our outreach events. And they've been doing this for some time, uh, and our rocket team in particular are very good at running these activities uh, with rockets. And one of the ones uh, that I was first involved in uh, when we had the International Astronautical Congress in Australia, uh, a whole lot of astronauts came out for it. So with AIAA, uh, we organised to have them come and speak to, uh, there is meant to be, so are all my pictures not going to be here? Because that's going to be a very boring presentation, if so. <laughs> well, so imagine that there is a photo of one of our former students speaking to a crowd of people. Uh, there we go. All right, so while that's happening. Uh, so this was an event we ran uh, in conjunction with uh, the IAC or just before it. And we were targeting uh, lower socioeconomic schools. And one of the things that I, uh, I only have anecdotal experience of this, I don't have hard data, but we seem to have a lot more success engaging young women when we go through the lens of space than when we go through the lens of aviation. So this was an example of something where, I mean, in aerospace, our gender representation is just awful. Uh, and with this, we set a quota of the students who could enroll in it at 50% had to be female, and we actually managed 65%. And at least experientially, when we make the focus civil or military aviation, we don't get these sort of numbers. So this was an event where we had them all launch little model rockets. We had a panel, 60% of the panel was female, 50% of our volunteers, uh, and again, 65% of the students. Now, I suspect the clicker won't work. Oh, well, there we go. That slide was meant to be hidden because when I practiced this, it was over 15 minutes. Uh, but I will just briefly mention, since you're talking about Mars sample return, uh, that's Megan Munro in the top there, a former student of ours. She's at Airbus in the UK working on the European component of Mars sample return. Uh, and she founded the rocket team here. So. Uh, well, there's all these slides that I hid because I wasn't going to show that now you're going to get to see. So uh, this hopefully will play. Uh, so the main initiative I want to talk about that we've been involved in is the Victorian Indigenous Engineering Winter School, which is a collaboration between four universities as well as industry here in Victoria. It's been running for about eight years now. And we bring Indigenous students from all around Australia, often from quite remote communities, they live on campus at the University of Melbourne for five days, and they spend one day at each of the four universities, then one day with industry. And we try to give them, you know, a, a speed dating engineering experience. And the activity that we choose as our sort of flagship activity here at Monash is with our rocket team, who again do all of the actual work. Uh, let's, because it's all videos. Uh, so what you would imagine here, if you could see it, would be a whole lot of students getting really, really involved uh, in decorating rockets, uh, putting on the nose cones, the tail fins, loading the parachutes, etc., and then going out and launching them. Everyone looking really happy and excited while this is taking place. Um, I'm sure you're visualizing it as we speak. And you'll see that that video was taken from 2019. Now, Chris already mentioned. Awesome. All right, next slide. So... So what can we do to actually make this a little more tactile, a little more interactive? Can we just mail them their own rockets so they can set them off themselves? And if you've ever had anything to do with operational health and safety or legal liability, you might immediately realize that's a bad idea. Uh, so I'm not quite that naive. We sent them water rockets. So air pressure driven water rockets. We got 30 of these. We got the bottles. We got spare O-rings. We got art supplies. We packaged them all up. Uh, and we sent them to students all over Australia in the mail. 
so the next thing we did was we said, okay, well, we can't be there with you to launch them, so we'll launch some ourselves, and we uploaded the videos. Uh, and this was some videos of some rockets being launched out there. Uh, and then on the next slide, if you could see it, uh, what we did is our laboratory, amongst things that we specialize in, is using very, very high-speed cameras to study fluid flows. So we have cameras that go to a million frames a second, two million frames a second, et cetera. And so we took some of our less expensive cameras down and pointed them at the exhaust of the water rocket and showed it, you know, okay, so you can see your rocket taking off. This is what it looks like at 1,000 frames a second. This is what it looks like at 5,000 frames a second. And then, it's really sort of lacking the impact when you can't see it here, but again, imagine that this one is now happening at like 2,000 frames a second. I promise, it's beautiful. Now, all this interesting turbulence in the flow and instabilities and all kinds of other things. And so then we said, okay, and if, if you were here, this is the rocket we would launch for you, this little chemical rocket. And to stop them being too disappointed, we said, which is the real rocket? What makes a rocket a real rocket? Well, we put the water rocket and the chemical rocket side by side. So it turns out when one has an ignition delay time and the other one's just mechanically launched, the, ro the water rocket goes a lot faster. So you've got the real rocket, don't feel too bad about it. We gave them a safety briefing, we said go outside, launch your rockets, take a video and send it back to us. This is meant to be the comedic interlude where we watch the videos they sent us. So I'll do my best to describe them. Uh, this was one of the first that was sent to us, and I would point out that these come with a 10 meter long string that you're supposed to use to launch it. That still frame is from the moment before the student pulls the string, which tips the rocket directly towards them, at which point it launches. A completely different student in a different place is standing further away, achieves the same thing not once, but twice. Uh, and we're sitting on Zoom, just these videos are starting here, ready to come back. Uh, and then this is a video, uh, and maybe it's better this one didn't play because the camera person gets very enthusiastic and lets out a long string of profanity, but they successfully launch the rocket and it flies out to the middle of the road. So hopefully someone who's become inspired that they wish to launch things further and faster and higher. So you can run a rocket activity even in the world's most locked down city. Uh, Uh, and this is the research part, and I'm just going to talk about something that we're working on in my own research group. Uh, the title is Reducing Rocket Resonance is the Key to Safer Space Flight, or as I also call it, Alluring Alliteration is Required to Receive Regular Research Remuneration. Uh, part of an ongoing hypothesis test I'm doing that grants with catchy titles are more likely to be funded. So far the answer appears to be yes. Uh, other academics, please don't steal. Original idea. Thank you. So, again, this would be a lovely series of videos.
a lot of these things, as they do in academia, starts with an academic becoming obsessed with a particular problem for no apparent reason. And for me, it was a problem called jet screech, which is when you have a supersonic jet that has shock waves in it, it can produce this really horrible high intensity sound. And in like the 1990s in the United States, this was sort of a hot topic. And then they realized they could just design around it by making the nozzles a bit thicker and a bit stronger, and they stopped funding research on it. Uh, but I got obsessed with this uh, during my PhD, and I convinced the funding agency here that actually it was still a relevant and topical problem. Uh, and in true Australian fashion, if you've ever seen, uh, say, speed skating at the Winter Olympics, the way Australians win gold medals is they just wait for everyone else to fall over and then skate to the finish line. Uh, so that did actually happen. Uh, so that's kind of me and Jet Screech. I just waited till everyone else fell out of the race and then I became the world expert. Uh, and luckily, after a while, it became relevant again. Uh, purely good fortune and luckily, I've put in my O&R slide, since we have <laughs> O&R Global Science Director here. Uh, we're working with uh, the US Office of Naval Research under Steve Martins, looking at this screech problem in twin jets, because it turns out not a big deal when you have one jet, becomes a big deal when you have two, because the jets harmonize their motions. So if you have two jets together, they can go like this, like this. I do a lot of interpretive dance at conferences these days. And so this harmony seems like a really beautiful idea, all the jets are dancing together, except the sound gets so strong it can actually bust the tail section of the aircraft. So ONR is interested in understanding and mitigating this, we're working with them on that, which then takes us to rockets. Now, this is one of your videos, not one of mine. The space shuttle main engine, during the startup, this pattern forms on the inside of the nozzle which is a shock separation process. So as the nozzle is going from its starting condition to its full flow condition, it passes through a regime where shock waves form inside the nozzle. And these generate loads on the side of the nozzle, which are really, really bad. The nozzle is engineered to take loads in one direction, not sideways. And this is a shock separation process, which is sort of shown here. These big, solid, dark lines are shock waves, and they're generating all these complex flow structures. And right around the time that I was thinking of writing a fellowship application, someone very usefully for me decided to take one of the historical correlations for jet screech and put a whole lot of rocket resonance data on top of it. It matches perfectly. Isn't that wonderful? So. Thus, uh, I'm currently doing a future fellowship, reducing rocket resonance is alluring alliteration, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at these resonance processes that take place both inside the rocket nozzle and between the rocket nozzle and the pad. I wanted to have at least a little bit about physics here, just quickly acknowledge some collaborators, NASA, NASA Marshall, who they don't have propulsion in the name, but they do do rockets. Uh, they've given us the nozzle design. Uh, Brigham Young do the only large-scale acoustic testing. Uh, they go out in the field and measure Falcon 9 with microphones and that sort of stuff. I'm trying to get security clearance to go over there and do it. If I could get a character reference, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, working with Stanford on simulations, Michigan Stability Analysis, whole lot of partners, because the only nozzles we have here are quite small. And this is going to be my one little detour into the specific physics. So if we take, this is some work actually done by one of our undergraduate students, a numerical simulation here, and you can see this sort of wave-like structure in the pressure field. These are the shock waves that form when we're passing through this state. Jets are characterized by these traveling waves in the form of these vortical structures that pass through. And in my PowerPoint animation that was meant to be perfectly synced with the video, just imagine that this is perfectly synced with my beautiful visualization. 
It turns out in fluid mechanics, if you have a stationary wave embedded in the flow, and you have a traveling wave moving past it through a process called triadic interaction. This creates two new waves, one of which goes downstream, one of which comes upstream. And the upstream one feeds energy back and creates a resonance loop. And the reason why this is a problem uh, is the structure, despite the fact it's represented sort of 1D here, is actually like a corkscrew motion, which means you've got a pressure, high pressure region moving around your nozzle, constantly bending it and bending it and bending it. Not a good thing when you're trying to make a lightweight, safe rocket. So we've taken our resonance model for jet screech, and this is, I don't think the student's here, unfortunately, because uh, I didn't know students could come to this, so I told him not to show up. Uh, but his results, based on our resonance model there, are in the purple, with other people's experiments in the orange, and the yellow and the historical correlation in the blue. So it really looks like this is what's driving the problem uh, in rocket resonance, which is very exciting. And i will just missing most of the pictures again, but just as a quick aside with my colleagues at Brigham Young, they've started looking at uh, what would it mean to launch rockets from Australian spaceports in terms of the noise. Many of our launch sites are remote. They're on places that, you know, are still managed by the traditional custodians. As of yet, we don't really have much consideration of noise impact. And what you should see here is a map of expected perceived sound over the barrier reef from Gilmore's proposed launch site. If they launch one of their Eris rockets, you're looking at about 75 dB over the reef. Not terrible, but no one's really talking about it yet. Maybe we do need to be. At least that's what we're going to tell the space agency when we ask for money. Uh, and that was meant to be a picture of my two-year-old son cuddling a stuffed Saturn V. Cheers. <laughs> Um, I'm going to turn now our last um, speaker for the day, uh, Professor Andy Tompkins, um, who's from the School of Atmosphere and Environment, um, and also Associate Professor Paul Lasky. Are you both together? Or oh, right, I've got Andy's name here as well. From the School of Physics and Ast Astronomy from the Faculty of Science. So, welcome. Hope you haven't got the video. Uh, oh. <laughs> Tough act to follow, there, but I don't know. There's what the child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we are. <laughs> I'm hoping this is going to be much more less eventful. Um, uh, my name is Paul Lasky. Uh, I am from the Faculty of Science, uh, and in particular the School of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, and it gives me hopefully great pleasure uh, to... Yeah. Oh, they're in the wrong order. Yeah, keep going down. Yep, that's... Yep, perfect. Uh, so I'm going to share a quick presentation with Andy uh, from the School of uh, Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. Um, and so I am the head of astrophysics within, within the School of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, I'm also the node leader for the new Osgrave Centre of Excellence, which I will we'll talk about just soon. And this is some beautiful artwork that was done. It's actually sitting on the side of a supercomputer uh, at Swinburne that we use for a lot of our gravitational wave astronomy. And it really depicts some of the research that we're doing uh, with Albert Einstein peering out into space and watching two black holes merge. They don't generally have accretion disks like that. So there's some artistic license, but I think it's a really beautiful image and depicts uh, really well some some of the, the science we're trying to do. And this is actually a, a life-size mural on the side of a supercomputer, which is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and that's done by artist-in-residence, Carl Knox, uh, who's uh, part of Osgrave. Uh, so uh, within the School of Physics and Astronomy, we have a lot of different schools, uh, a lot of different sort of subgroups, uh, including particle physics, which has a huge, uh, does a huge array of research, both in theoretical aspects, but also experimental aspects, a lot to do with LHCB experiments and things along those lines. Phys physics of imaging, predominantly X-ray imaging, a lot of synchrotron science, both here at the uh, uh, synchrotron across the road over in Clayton, um, but also using synchrotrons all across the world. Uh, we've also got a, a sort of Bergewinian group and physics education research, looking at best practice in terms of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, education research. Uh, and then there's also a group called QLIMES, uh, which stands for Quantum Light Information Matter and Electronics, uh, which has a broad range of topics such as low energy technologies, uh, and also just understanding sort of the quantum information and, and quantum nature of matter. But what I want to focus on more is sort of astrophysics. Uh, there's a word galaxies there that's a bit anomalous, but we'll probably fill that in at some point. Um, 
Uh, we do have 13 tenured faculty. <laughs> yeah, it's not as bad yet. Hang on, let's let's let's. We'll compare notes afterwards. Uh, we do have 13 tenured faculty, 15 research fellows, and 28 PhD students. We don't quite have a $2.3 billion budget, um, but maybe Jordan can do something to sort of lift it close to that. Um, we do have a lot of uh, work in stellar explosions and nuclear synthesis. Uh, so, you know, understanding from very first principles how stars explode, simulating them, uh, and all, all the way through to really observing supernovae across the universe. Uh, we, whoa, they've all come up together. We have exoplanet research, uh, and that's where the galaxy picture fit into things. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the galaxies, but I will touch back on exoplanets, especially given the relevance uh, to what you were talking about uh, in terms of what JPL is doing. Uh, and also then there's a really good linkage there with, uh, with Earth, Earth atmosphere and environment, which is going to be sort of the segue through to what Andy's going to speak about as well. Um, but just to say, uh, the other side of the exoplanet research is also star and planet formation. Uh, and I, I would play a, a game for everyone here. There's two side-by-side -side images there. One is real and one's a simulation. Uh, and when you talk about the fact that we can't visual, we, we don't have a perfect ability to actually see planets, well, actually what we can see uh, is within protoplanetary disks, we can see large gaps where planets have been carv are carving out regions. And this goes towards that uh, center of excellence bid that we'll talk about very shortly. Uh, just so you know, the image on the left, I hope, is the real image from the ELMA Space Telescope. Uh, and there's a, a couple of planets there. The image on the right was performed by uh, Professor Daniel Price and, and colleagues within the, within the school. Uh, and that is a hydrodynamic simulation of a protoplanetary disk uh, with a, where a planet is carving out the ring. Uh, and so you can really see the amazing uh, links there and, and our ability to understand planet formation through these kinds of simulations uh, as well as through the observations which we're performing here as well. Um, but what I'll talk about first is high energy astrophysics and in particular gravitational waves and we've got a really strong group working on that not just within Monash but it's a really exciting space within Australia in general. So we have, whoops, there we go. Uh, gravitational wave astronomy in general has been supported in particular for the last seven years through what's called a Center of Excellence grant. The Center of Excellence funds OSGRAV. Uh, that was recently renewed uh, and is due to start again up in April 1st, 2024. So this is basically 14 years of continued funding to do research in gravitational wave science. So of course, gravitational waves were first discovered in 2016 from the merger of two black holes. We were heavily involved in that, along with a lot of researchers at Caltech and uh, all over the US as well. And you know, we, we are part of the LIGO collaboration, uh, working with people in, with two big observatories detecting gravitational waves. Uh, for example, we wrote the software that now analyzes all of the gravitational waves that come through uh, the, the LIGO interferometers, the LIGO observatories, uh, to understand the astrophysics, to understand the physics, to really probe gravity, probe extreme matter in the most uh, violent and unusual regions of the universe that we, that we really possibly can. So we're a, a 250 uh, plus team across eight institutes within Australia. Um, this figure on the bottom right here really shows the sort of broad array uh, of science that we do within this OSGRAV Centre of Excellence and in particular the upcoming OSGRAV Centre of Excellence. So there's a discovery theme which really works on uh, measuring gravitational waves with the LIGO instrumentation. We have an instrumentation theme and I'll talk about that just in a second. Um, that in the past has focused on things like technology like quantum squeezing, beating the quantum limit uh, in actually measuring these tiny, tiny fluctuations of distance that gravitational waves create. Uh, and then we have a physics theme really trying to understand how gravity works, how extreme matter works, how we can make measurements of cosmology and things along those lines. And there's some more, even more synergies there again with JPL uh, in the sense that you know, we have strong ties with LISA, um, both in terms of, uh, so the LISA is a, a space-based gravitational wave observatory, a uh, million kilometer arms, and you basically hold these three, t three satellites a million kilometers away from each other uh, and you don't let them move uh, and you measure these tiny tiny fluctuations and, and JPL is involved in a lot of the technology that's gone into that. Um, but this sort of advanced funding has allowed us to really think where do we want to be in 7, 8, 10, 15, 20 years time and the answer to that is we want to build our own observatory and so we're working very closely with our uh, American colleagues who are planning for the next generation of gravitational wave instruments uh, and we really want to build a 
Gravitational Wave Observatory in Australia. So I chair up this Gravitational Wave Observatory project uh, where we're trying to understand the feasibility, the economic case, the science case, all of these kinds of things to build an actual observatory in Australia. This can look like a couple of things. We've got a proposal for something called NEMO, which opens up a new frequency band in terms of this gravitational wave science, uh, where we'd actually be able to probe uh, quantum chromodynamics, so nuclear matter in regions where you have absolutely no ability to do that uh, with terrestrial experiments. And that's something that we're really trying to push. And of course, in the US, they're building, a, or they want to be building uh, an observatory called Cosmic Explorer. This is on the order of a three billion dollar project uh, and we'd really like to build Cosmic Explorer South. You need more than one of these observatories across the globe to be able to measure actually where these gravitational waves come from. So of course we're looking for national and international partners, wink wink nudge nudge. Um, we, you know, Australia is a perfect location for any of this and we've done sort of some site selection studies and it turns out you can put it anywhere. We don't have seismic noise or that's all that substantial. We've got an abundance of land, um, you know, we've, there, there's lots of opportunities here. So this is really where we're at with the gravitational wave astronomy. We've got funding to, to do these studies uh, and we're really pushing sort of hard on this at the moment. Um, the segue now to, to bring Andy up is to really talk about this new center of excellence, uh, which is a proposal that's about to go in, uh, and again, looking for international partners, which I think Andy will talk about in a little bit more. And it's called The Origin of Life's Ingredients, uh, with a, a subheading that I'm not sure how serious it is, but the future of mining. Uh, and the, <laughs> this is a slide that I think Andy's going to show, so I'll, I'll call him up here now. And uh, I've mentioned already the astrophysics side of this, but I'll, I'll let you take over. Radio. Um, I think Georgina is going to find my slides, which are before these ones, so this will be interesting. Um, yeah, so that Centre of Excellence uh, in, in Australia, a Centre of Excellence is one of those four, 30 to $40 million huge grants to do seven years of research on a particular topic. So we're in development at the moment for a, a Centre of Excellence in effectively planetary science that marries astronomy and, and planetary science traditionally together. Um, so that's kind of my segue from Paul into what I'm talking about. I'm going to go opposite to what Larry talked about. Larry was talking from Earth to big, and I'm talking from big, where Paul was, to small, focusing on the Earth towards the end of my little talk. So, um, yeah, so it says origin of life's ingredients. That includes elements and where they're produced inside stars. And then it's also include understanding where those elements, uh, how those elements come together to be produced inside asteroids and planets and that sort of stuff. And then focusing in on uh, astrobiochemistry type stuff as well. So let's see where we go with this. So the astronomers come in on this from this side. We come in on it from a, that's a, that's a comet, but we come in on it from the point of view of uh, asteroids. We're trying to marry the two together. So um, meteoritists like me tend to work on the meteorites, the tiny little scales of what's inside the rocks that formed four and a half billion years ago. And the astronomers observe these things and see particles that are the same size as the particles we see inside meteorites. And so we get together and have all sorts of inter interesting discussions. So that's kind of the point of this center of excellence is to marry that stuff together. So in our school, that's the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment, we've got quite a few people doing different flavors of planetary science. That's kind of what I'm trying to cover today, different flavors of the sorts of things we do. Um, so this is a little bit slow. Keep going. Here we go. We tend to publish pretty well. I won't dwell on all that sort of stuff, but we, we're doing pretty high level science. For quite a number of years, um, I've been heading out to the deserts to pick up meteorites and that sort of stuff. And this has been a really good pathway for students coming into planetary science at a more advanced level. So some of these guys, she's done a NASA internship. Um, two of my other students have done NASA internships and they've gone on to PhDs and postdocs and all that sort of stuff. So it's, this sort of thing has been a really good way to bring students into it and, and take them further. Um, at the moment, some of the more high-level people doing research at the moment is these groups. So Rachel and Sean there are postdocs. Um, and then Hugh in the middle there is a former ARC Laureate Fellow, which is like a high-level research person in Australia, it's mainly for the other people in, at Monash here. And so we've got a pretty strong team in the school just doing meteorites type stuff. And that sort of underpins this... Um, I guess I'll start with the Australian level observatory. So this started out with something called the Desert Fireball Network that was started by Curtin University. And we've started to collaborate with them as it's transitioned into um, something called the Global Fireball Observatory. So to start with, each of those spots there is a, is a place in Australia where we've set up 
one of these things, which is a stand that where a camera sits on top of this and looks up at the sky all night long, an old sky fisheye lens that tracks in fireballs. And you use several of these things to pinpoint on the ground where those fireballs land. You can go around and pick them up, but you can then you know take it back to the lab and analyze it. But you trace the origins of that meteor to somewhere out in the solar system. So you can literally have this sample from a known place in the solar system. So it's like sample return without going out there, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, it's slightly cheaper. <laughs> it is, is fairly work intensive to get out there and have a look for these things. But um, that's evolved into something called the Global Fireball Observatory. And you can see on this map here that there's quite a few institutions in the US here that are collaborators here. So NASA is a collaborator. Um, there's quite a few cameras in the US. And this has recovered quite a few meteorite falls now and we have or orbital origins for those meteorites and all sorts of fun science is going on. So that's a, an active collaboration we have now. We've got multiple grants in that space, more going in, that sort of thing. Um, and then what we do with those recovered meteorites is look at what's inside them. So this is a picture here that I took a couple of days ago of one of the meteorites we found. And it's basically showing a particle here that's four and a half billion years old and it's showing you multiple events multiple heating events that's gone on. Daniel here is the astrophysicist who looks at interacting disks around stars and if you have two disks interacting, what sort of heating events go on? So we can relate those sort of things to, together to understand how our early solar system evolved. So that's some of the meteorites research. Some of the research we do here is down at the Australian Synchrotron, which is about 300 meters that way. And so Tani here, my PhD student, is standing in front of the synchrotron. This map here is a map of the minerals inside a Martian meteorite. So that's a some of the stuff we do, there's quite a few of us who do synchrotron science down there. Um, some of the stuff we do is astrobiochemistry. So instead of following the water, which is NASA's thing, we do follow the nutrients. And so that's rec recognizing that nutrients, the earliest nutrients on, you know, on Earth were um, chemolithotrophs, meaning they live off the chemical energy inside rocks. And so it turns out, when you look at the minerals inside a meteorite, they're much better energy targets for microbes than the surface of Mars is, for example. Um, so we've been doing that sort of research for a few years now, and that's still going. Oh, yeah. So Alistair is a former um, JPL intern. Did a postdoc, all that sort of stuff afterwards. Rachel's actively working with us now. She's down in microbiology. So she's a biologist. We've got Andrew Gunn. This is zooming in to more surface type features now. Gunners did his postdoc at in uh, where was it Stanford? Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> um, he has a couple of NASA grants to do dunes on Mars and uh, dunes on Titan, all that sort of stuff. Um, so he's looking at uh, dune orientation to figure out wind directions coming off the North Pole of Mars, for example. Um, he's been He's got all these collaborators in the US because of that postdoc at Stanford. He's come and joined us as a continuing academic now. You can see the different academics he collaborates with over there. Um, so he's doing quite a bit of work. He's gen generating a big team of students now. There's some of his grad students doing everything from Mars polar caps to analogs on Earth for the processes we see on other planets to um, stuff on Titan as well. Then focusing on Earth, doing opposite of Larry. We're finishing off with, oh no, we've got one more, sorry. This is Fabio. Fabio's doing, um, he's a geodynamicist, so he does numerical models of the flow inside planets to predict plate tectonic processes. So he's, he's doing a model for Ishtar Terra, which is a plateau on Venus. So he's, this is a, a cross-sectional model through Venus to, as a model of what, how those plateaus form on Venus. And then focusing on Earth more, we've got, Dr. Felicity McCormack's um, been with us for a few few years now. She's one of the co-developers of this thing. This is the JPL Dartmouth Ice Sheet and Sea Level System Model, ISSM. So she's been working with um, NASA guys to develop this ice sheet model. So they've got a very active group. You can see there she's got postdocs, PhD students, uh, honours students, everything in between, um, and still working with those guys to develop uh, ice sheet models for Antarctica, that sort of thing. So. Quite a, quite a strong uh, collaboration with JPL there. There's the JPL developers who, who she's working with. So I'll wrap it up there so I don't go on for too long. Um, keen to collaborate on the Center of Excellence stuff in particular. We're kind of looking to develop collaborations with NASA, JPL, 
So anyway, so thanks very much. Thank you. Um, that kind of comes to a conclusion. And, but before um, that, I just wanted to also just acknowledge a couple of people um, that are here visiting us, um, external people. So Lawrence Reese is a ministerial advisor for Minister Natalie Hutchins, um, the Minister for Jobs and Industry, Minister for Treaty and First Peoples, uh, Minister for Women. I also want to acknowledge and thank, um, uh, welcome Scott Adlington, who's the Senior Investment Manager, Defence and Aerospace at the State Government of Victoria. Dr. Clint Novotin, close enough, Science Director, Office of uh, the Naval Research Global, owner Global Melbourne, um, and thank them for coming. I also want to acknowledge um, Professor Janis Ventikos, who's the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, and Professor Jordan Nash, um, the Dean of Faculty of Science, who also came along and also supported this event, um, as did um, Janis and um, Anne, our Dean of Faculty of Information Technology. And just thank all my other colleagues that are here today and all the people that have pulled this together. And of course, to thank um, Larry for coming and sharing that um, amazing um, presentation with us and giving us all a better insight into what NASA and Jet Propulsion Labor Laboratory does. And of course, how we all can kind of work together and collaborate together. I think there were a lot of pictures here this afternoon. <laughs> but um, thank the students as well for coming. And of course, our um, three Indigenous, um, NASA Indigenous, um, National Indigenous Base Academy students um, for sharing their journey and experiences with us. So that kind of wraps up um, the formalities and the presentations. I just want to, if we can all give a big hand uh, for Larry to thank him <laughs> and, and all the other speakers. So thank you all very much.